Oh, it's Scott Manley here. It's episode 16 of the reusable space program. Having finally got a reasonable size fuel tanker on the surface of the moon, we are loading it up, filling it up using that uh, quantum fuel transfer module, which uh, many of you noticed wasn't transferring, uh, transferring oxidizer. And the reason was that uh, it only transfers what's in the tank. And when you go back to the spacecraft that's doing the refining, it's only refining the... It's refining liquid fuel first, and then when that fills up, it refines the oxidizer. So it's basically just, uh, you know, it's order of preference or whatever that the refiner's generating. Anyway, you know, we, we send our dude away back into his home, uh, literally his home, uh, get our stuff ready to launch. I couldn't figure out how to detach the, the fuel line, but I figure it'll just disappear. Look, we can see it in the sky. We can see the Artemis station flying overhead when we wait for it to get in close. We are going to head straight for it. Well, not straight for it. We're gonna, what we're going to do is fire up, go sideways as fast as we can, and then once we're up near orbital velocity, we'll switch to trying to align velocities with the target. You see here the the target already has a position and everything up there so i'm just going to start trying to aim for that so that we're actually going towards the target this is a really fast way to get to a target it is terribly inefficient with fuel but we are flying a fuel tanker we have so much fuel that it doesn't matter right there we go we're just going to keep keep that pointer on the on the reticule there we just need to obviously turn around because we are going to we're approaching at 200 meters per second, which means we're going to cover these uh, this distance rather quickly. It's a good thing I have that mainsail then. Huh? But a lot of people were suggesting I used uh, engine clusters, but uh, to get this off the ground, I do need a mainsail. Now, you could put seven engines on there. The only problem is uh, I would then have to move the locations of the tanks surrounding it because they would the engines would then get in the way. So I kind of stuck with the design. I have considered engine clusters before, but I don't know. I've not had a huge success. I just seem to keep on designing ships that don't really accept them particularly well. But anyway, that's us. We're getting in close. So uh, we have a fuel load. We need to figure out the best way to actually dock. And unfortunately, uh, I guess the best uh, docking node is on the opposite side of the station. So yeah, just taking a standard approach to the station, and I'm obviously using engine power to keep, uh, to adjust my approach vector here, and everything starts to go a little wrong here when I start spinning out of control and almost smash into the station. Uh, and uh, even better, my exhaust from my rocket seems to have hit something on the station because what happens is the entire space station starts rotating in front of me. So um, I probably cooked uh, some sensors or something on the outside. Thankfully, uh, the fuel tanks were not particularly fuel, full, full of fuel because that could have been oh, disastrous. We all know what happened during the the Challenger disaster where, uh, yeah, the, the flare from the solid rocket boosters essentially ignited the the tank the main tank actually it's a little more complicated than that it it didn't actually cause the main tank to explode what it did was it caused the uh it caused the structural mounts holding the srb in place to break and then it skewed off and the whole vehicle essentially turned side on to a into the airstream but yes we docked and we have oodles of fuel to unload. I mean, literally, we just keep on adding fuel to this station, fill up almost everything, and then we can depart and return to the lunar surface before day daylight uh, disappears. Obviously, we are currently restricted to daytime-only operations because we don't have enough RTGs to run all the drills and the, the refining system. So we're going to get down onto the moon and uh, hopefully have a few more hours, maybe a few more minutes at most. Look at it leaving us, be leaving it behind. It's always kind of cool to watch things fall away from us in orbit. Even although it, it looks like it looks like it's fast, it doesn't actually make that much difference. Quite a big inclination adjustment I'm having to make here. Once again, it's a good thing that I have plenty of fuel. So, yeah, another thing to note is that this is all being done in post-production right now, and this was like the episode from hell. Everything was going wrong. I lost all sorts of things. I reloaded safe files that worked out really good, you know, that destroyed good work. I um, destroyed videos, which showed, you know, key parts of things and had to recreate some bits. Uh, but I think I've got all the relevant and important bits here, so... 
hopefully you won't mind too much. I <laughs> I might go back and recreate things if there really is a demand to see. I mean, you know, you're going to see the launch vehicles that I used for some of the later stuff. In particular, I lost four launches that uh, I had details for. Coming in a little low here, I think I need to uh, fire vertical a little. It's hard to tell. Oh, no, I guess I'm already going up. Yeah. So I already came in low. <laughs> And now it's just a case of trying to get over this. I'm doing this landing manually. Previously, on the first time I did this, if you remember, I used Mechanical Jeb's landing autopilot. Uh, and I specifically had boosted into a 100 kilometer orbit so that it would put me very close to where I wanted to land. But I'm mostly going to, I'm using, you know, Mechanical Jeb as a kind of stabilizer here, as an intelligent stabilizer that will return me to vertical every time I let go of the controls. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to kind of get down and try to get close to Prometheus here, which uh, has served me better than the movie did, sadly. Uh, I, presumably these, these Kerbals are a little more intelligent than the people in the Prometheus were. <laughs> there, now we're getting nice and low. We're just going to shivel sideways. Shivel, is that a word? Slip sideways. Get nice and close. Using the using the translatron with the keep vert option, as soon as I let go, it tries to kill my lateral velocity. I'm just trying to get it as close as possible because, well, you know, it looks kind of cool being close. So there we are, once again, getting ourselves set up for another another day of mining. The moon is, or the sun is, or the moon is turning and the sun is coming down over the horizon. There, look at these guys. They're going to probably stay the night because we don't get enough fuel to actually refill the the miner. So everyone will no doubt retire to the home base for a good night's sleep while we wait for the sun to return to this venture. Obviously, we're going to have to build something far more, far more better. Anyway, yes, uh, we have a full load of fuel, so time to return to the planet Kerbin. And uh, let we're just doing this from inside the cockpit, mostly because it looks cool. Have I mentioned that I think the B-9 Aerospace cockpit is one of the best-looking parts in the game? At least from the interior. I really I really like that. Somebody showed me a nice uh, mock-up. I think it was a Photoshop or a picture of the, the Eagle from Space 1999. Now, that is one I would really like. Also notice that uh, I've accidentally induced a rotation because I got my thrust back to front and started pushing forwards. So I gotta come out fast enough before this thing comes around and smacks my ship. But it does get me a nice look at the space station there, doesn't it? Oh, Artemis, look at you. Aren't you beautiful? Well, in, in your own particular special way. Yes, three spacecraft on it. Uh, well, plus there's the tug, I guess. Yeah, we're gonna put that. Uh, we're gonna put the the crawler, not the crawler, the spider, to more use. And um, we are gonna start landing a proper moon base as soon as I bring it back. Now this is this is the space train. This is carrying fuel back to the planet Kerbin. And when it gets there, it will unload and it will pick up the space station components, which will be launched. Um, while I'm en route, and that is unfortunately some of the stuff we lost. Also, also lost in this most terribly hard episode <laughs> was the the point when I realized that the orbits that I was going to put the communication satellites into were really suboptimal. Having equatorial orbits with basically no battery power meant that every orbit we would be getting eclipsed by the the moon. And that would kill our communications at that time. And, you know, that would not be great. So if I decided that if I stuck them into braid orbits instead, which is essentially what GPS uses, it's it's 55 degree inclination and you stagger their... Um, you stagger the longitude of the ascending node and their phase to make sure that they all kind of always keep the keep the the moon or the target always covered. Your know, GPS uses something like, I don't know, 50 satellites? I don't know, it's, it's a lot of satellites. They have multiple, they have something like six satellites in each orbit. I, I don't remember precisely. But uh, 55 degrees is apparently the magic number to use. And this was figured out some time ago. Uh, not to be confused, this would be a braid formation, which you can't see yet. 
The braid formation is not to be confused with the, the three body solution that I showed in a previous video. Anyway, we're waiting to get into position so we can burn home. This is obviously um, this is obviously carrying a lot more load, so it's not as fast as it was, not as sprightly as it once was, but it's still managing. It looks like a you know, 0.3 of a G maybe. I should probably pay attention to actually what it's saying there, but I'm moving around too much, getting a good look at the moon there. And yeah, five, six, yeah, maybe maybe half a G. Of course, this is accelerated, time accelerated, and we're just gonna get ourselves onto our return trajectory. And this thing is gonna continue to function as a space train. We're gonna, once we've dropped off the fuel, we're gonna hook up more supplies for the moon, and it's gonna chug, chug, chug like the little engine that could, climbing up the slope of Kerbin's gravity well out to where the moon is. Yeah, okay, I'm also going to try and do a, you know, one burn capture, right? I'm going to try and get this synchronized up. You remember that was a rather difficult thing, but we'll see that in a moment. See, so I get our orbit down. That's pretty close. We're, we're going to leave some room to maneuver. And now that we're on a return trajectory, we are going to start launching the components of our space station because it will take us a few hours to get there. And that's why I'm saying there was problems. <laughs> Unfortunately. So yeah, this is the one thing I did have. This is this is essentially a series of street lights for the for the um for the moon base, right? So these have little probes on them, they have the tiny engines, and they're very, very light. They have an RTG, so that they're powered at night, and then they have four lamps, and they, they'll sit around the surface. I'm tr gonna try and designate a landing area with them. Uh, the whole thing actually sits on a transfer bus, which I'll talk about later. Meanwhile, this guy is gonna go and hang out here because the Mooner bus also needs to get on a return trajectory. That's one thing that I did capture. <laughs> Rather boring, but uh, it's going to need to do that. It, it's going to come back because it's going to be the one carrying the lighting rigs. The lighting rig only has one docking port because it's it's really designed to be carried out and returned in one trip. It's not really designed to park anywhere. Uh, you'll you'll see what happens there. Oh, look at that! Looking at the space station through my through my cockpit view. Taking one last look for the... Because these guys are actually going to spend a long time in space. They're not planning to dock for a, a good amount of time. Their fuel supplies will get them everywhere. So now, yes. Notice I have managed to adjust my orbit, get my approach distance down to 4.86 kilometers. So this is going to be hard because we have to... We're going to actually have to start accelerating before we can see these guys, before we can see our target. And the reason is the, the deceleration from, you know, 900, we've got a delta V of like 900 meters per second to perform. And we need to do it from about 150 kilometers up, out, because our acceleration is so low. Now, um, I'm initially burning retrograde, but I'm also going to try and correct between retrograde and RVEL minus. And you see that as I switch between them, the approach distance goes up and down. I'm tr going to try and get the approach distance as low as possible. And this is going to require guesswork because it doesn't really tell you where, whether the approach distance is, you know, above or below, you know, relative to the target. It'd be nice to have a little instrument that tells you wh what way you're going to pass relative to the object. Maybe uh, I'll ask Ramon to go and figure that out. I'll also have to point out that uh, some other bugs I've found in MechGen. Look at us flying by. These are uh, a number of things. You see the lighting rig uh, we've parked in orbit here. And you couldn't read the other one, but that is the moon base. We, even starting 150 kilometers out, we overshoot by about 10 kilometers. That is uh, still it's pretty good to get within 10 kilometers after coming all the way from the moon. Now we've, we've nulled our velocity and we got to head back towards the target. And there we go. We're just going to adjust these things. And you see, I'm, I'm trying to work to bring the approach distance down to a reasonable value. As close as humanly possible is the technical term. Right? There we go. 4.1 kilometers. 
400 meters is my approach. Obviously, you can't get too close. We're just going to try and adjust things here. And you can hear the chair squeaking in the background. This is my son who's coming up here and he wants to get in in the video. Don't you, Orion? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's why the background is all those squeaking noises. I assure you that all the, the seat on the B9 is not nearly as squeaky if you buy it from the dealership. If you buy a used one, I can't promise you. <laughs> so we're just going to bring this around. I get to dock in the B9. I like docking the B9 because you can do a pretty good job of, of uh, using it from the first person point of view. Then we're coming. I pick one docking port and just going to try and get right underneath this thing. Again, that would be another reason why the close approach indicator would be good because it would show you whether you're coming in below it or above it. So there we go. I'm actually now going to show use mech jab to hold the alignment if you use par par minus i'm guessing that make it takes it parallel to the target vehicle and if you selected the you know a docking node then it will keep itself parallel to that it does a pretty good job of it so i've also transferred fuel because we used fuel kind of going backwards forwards and that meant that our vehicle was kind of heavier at the front than it was at the back and that was causing some pitching but now we've got it relatively well balanced and so I think I can do this mostly in the first person it's rather nice watching all this stuff there we go just clear out all the instruments and just have it hold location for me 22 meters and the only hard part is trying to make sure that the docking node which is offset a little actually interfaces with this thing and that takes a little bit of guesswork as to how far below you it is um, obviously these models don't break so you're not worried about you know smashing in your windshield with this why do they call it a windshield in space i mean it's not shielding you against the, w the wind it's shielding space against the wind right <laughs> there's no wind in space the only wind is in the the in the spacecraft so we'll tr transfer some fuel around and then we'll go undock and now we are heading over to make the giant space train. So yeah, over over four launches, I've been launching parts of a surface lunar base, and we've been docking these things together. Now, for because it was so big, uh, we didn't want to have it sitting near the space station simply because it would make the frame rate suicidally slow. So I parked it uh, about 10 kilometers behind it, I, which is also where I parked the the lighting rig as well. Uh, I've got pretty good at getting the matching the semi major axis. If you look, um, if you look in, in Mac Jab, it will give you a pretty accurate semi major axis, uh, and. You know, you, people, I've, I've said this before, people get really concerned about matching their peri apps and their apo apps. And the semi major axis is the average of these, right? So if you get those, the average of those to the correct one, to correct distance, then you will rotate at the right speed. Oh, yes. So yeah, here's the giant moon base in packaged form. Uh, it is only half of it. We've got another four modules. It is empty of fuel because it. To, you know, we needed that fuel for the launch mass. It took four launches and a lot of work to get these docked together. And we tested, actually tested it out on the runway first. But there, we're going to just adjust. We're using the PAR, the parallel. And it, unfortunately, because of the way this has worked, the the load is now further forward because we dumped most of our fuel into the space station. But we are able to come in with a little bit of work. We have plenty of RCS fuel, which is a good thing. Oh, no. No, no. Come on. This is not the most easy thing. In fact, this was one of the hardest dockings uh, I've had to do. Even with Mechanical Jeb helping me or hindering me. It just wobbled me around like a crazy thing. You can see it, like, not sure whether it wants to dock or not. So I turn it off. And there we go, we now have my giant space choo-choo train. <laughs> it is, it's like a big train, isn't it? How long is it, Orion? I think, I don't know. You think you don't know. It's really long. It's it's probably at least 100 meters long. It is not the longest spacecraft I have launched into space, I'll point out. 
Uh, the longest one, of course, is well. Actually, the longest one was the prototype for the for the hazmat lab on the YouTube space station, uh, which was longer than the one that I ended up using because uh, it needed more parts. But this is pretty long, and uh, it accelerates incredibly slowly because we only have those tiny but efficient nuclear engines. So we'll see the moon base building in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.